sitting here with Emily Shalom and she's going to tell us a bit about her recently published book. What's the book called? Um, for the blind among you, this book is called The Religion of Self-Enlightenment and my name is Emily B. Shalom. Um, there's a photograph in here to prove it. Uh, and the dedication is to you. It took me eight years to write and it's about a new religion and the man who writes it. It's fiction. Do you want to outline the story? Okay. Um, an extremely um, plain and unquestioning individual is led to question everything after a near-death experience in a car accident quite early in the book. It's not boring. It's ideally um, a very challenging novel which uh, people who've wanted to um, explore the meaning of life um, yeah. will find uh, relatable and um, hopefully it will allow them to feel less alone on planet Earth. <laughs> it's very peaceful and loving and um, happiness is a big part of the philosophy which is necessary in this day and age because essentially we live in a very stressful, war-torn society and world in general. It took me eight years to write. Everyone during that time told me not to write a book about religion and to take the word religion out of the title. And uh, now that it's out, I feel it's the perfect book at the perfect point in history to incite some kind of cultural discussion about how to connect with one another better. So is it... It's is it explaining, is it against other religions or is it... No, I want everyone to feel equally loved by these words and I deliberately designed it not to offend Christians, atheists, Muslims, Jewish people, anyone. So it's, it's dealing in the subject matter of religion? Yeah. But, but it's... Uh, yeah. It, but it's not about a religion that's trying to establish a new religion. It's not a new religion as such. No, it's about the quest of humanity. I mean, ideally, the main character would be humanity personified in that it's quite boring and normal and then everything goes very strange and chaotic and, and essentially he tries to like um, produce a utopian idea um, in the process has a lot of challenges and this kind of thing and uh, obviously it goes insane because insanity is a big part of humanity's quest for understanding um, and it's a big part of what drives people insane, questioning why we're here and who they are and this kind of thing. So Carrick, the, the, the what do they call him, the protagonist? Carrick Aries, yep. Carrick Aries is the person it's about and uh, there, are, there are actually very few people in the book itself as characters, aren't there? Mm. And he he ends up in a psychiatric hospital because of his near-death experience. Is this right? Can you That's explain correct. how he... The near-death experience uh, drives him to question why we're here and everyone else freaks out, worries about him, um, is seriously concerned about his mental well-being, well -being and uh, why he can't readjust to um, like wait, why he can't return to his previous life with ease and without any kind of questions asked about how he saw angels in the afterlife which he finds very difficult to deal with and uh, the friction resulted uh, that results from that experience leads to his uh, supposed insanity the question is is he insane or has he found some kind of answer that we're all looking for how does this connect to Mill Road? Mm. Um, I live on Mill Road and uh, I've lived in Cambridge on and off since I was 12 years old. A lot of my friends live down Mill Road. I've been to a lot of parties, talking to a lot of people about various ideas. And uh, I guess, although I grew up in Glastonbury, you know, and I love Glastonbury, there is a big part of my life which... <laughs> Um, is influenced by the amount of confused people in the world, most of whom I've met in Cambridge and uh, 
London, Brighton, any kind of artistic people. And uh, yeah, I've met a lot of people down Mill Road who uh, have these kind of um, worries and concerns about life. But there's quite a few uh, r different religious places on Mill Road, isn't there? Yeah, I've been to almost all of them. Do you think uh, all of those ministers, as it were, in each of those establishments would be willing to read your book and, and, and take part in a discussion in the, in the uh, subject matter raised? If they want to talk about the meaning of life, then there's no better book to ignite discussion because it's very compassionate and uh, there's an insistence upon the, the learning of you know, what is good, what is love, what is life about... Uh, philosophy and this kind of thing without any kind of pause of breath about you know shoes or hair or anything superficial so potentially there's, there's no reason why unless they really uh, they insist upon hatred and division I guess. You're relatively young to have taken uh, confronted such a huge subject well, I grew up in Glastonbury, and um, I've lived a very, very scary, tra traumatised life in a lot of ways, as most people have, in my experience, uh, in various ways, and I can't escape that feeling that someone needs to step into humanity and try and make some kind of impression upon the mainstream way of behaving, which is essentially buy loads of things and everyone will be happy. And, I don't know anyone who practices that way of life who will testify that that is an actual, you know, way to um, achieve contempt within your soul and within your heart and within your mind. I think there's serious problems with the way we're encouraging children to um, live nightmares. And uh, when I was 24, I had a nervous breakdown and um, I was extremely keen to uh, try and help people who came after me not live the way of, of life that people try and bully you into. Oh, was, that, was that your sort of near-death experience type thing? I haven't had a near-death experience actually and I've never been sectioned or anything so when people ask how much of the main character is reflected in my life, not very much. But metaphorically I have... <coughs> confusions and you know all these kind of things uh, which um, and also understandings and wisdom and you know hopefully something to tell people about which is worthy of communicating um, I'm very keen to uh, share my experiences and my love with people and uh, produce some kind of unity in a very divided society well, where can people get this book then? You can find it on my website. That will connect you to Amazon. Um, it, there are various um, plans in the future to promote it on television, radio, magazines. I have uh, people helping me to um, promote it in those uh, those formats, and I'm very happy to be interviewed and and uh, appear on on any kind of media outlets. And you're off, you're off around at the moment. I am, I'm going, going to London, uh, Glasgow, Europe, Ireland, Liverpool, it'll be fun. Good, and, and when, when, so it's early days yet to see what, what the, the feedback is or... Well I've sold it in four continents, I have fans in Mexico and Berlin and you know South Africa and Australia and all these kind of things so I have managed to... Um, form worldwide connections already and I'd like to continue to do so. Uh, I'm very approachable and uh, if you want to tweet me any kind of nonsense that you had on your mind, I'm very happy to interact with anyone. That's good. Well, the best of luck and we'll have to catch up with you in a six months or a year's time and see how it's gone. And I'll try to uh, arrange maybe a greater discussion with some of our clerical friends yeah and, that so, and, really so, and fun, some actually. and some uh, atheists and whoever else wants to join in
on the subject of these. Yeah, I'm not prejudiced. I'm fully aware that you know we need some kind of um, cohesive dialogue when it comes to religion. Um, terrorism is obviously a big concern for almost everyone in the Western world and around the world, like be it Mill Road, which is a multicultural community. We all want to live in peace and harmony and this kind of thing. And I'd like to think that we can achieve that without going to some kind of like major serious geopolitical global warfare, you know, to come out the other side and essentially, you know, have another UN or this kind of thing. I don't think that we need to get to that point. We just need to have open dialogue and philosophise a little bit about love and peace and happiness, which is essentially what everyone wants. But we have to pay the bills. Capitalism could potentially be a thing of the past, but I agree there is some need for money. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks very much, Emily. I don't do anything for money, though. <laughs> like, just to make that very clear to everyone, I don't do anything for money. I'm trying to help people. I've come from very, you know, a lot of suffering people have, have, have blessed my life and, and, you know, traumatised my life. So, essentially, the pain that I feel within me uh, is my number one kind of motivation to connect with other people's pain and not to shy away from it and allow people to live lives that are false and guarded and, and mediocre. How come it took eight years to write then? It's a long time. Well, it is a new religion and then uh, I was 24 when I started it, which is obviously very young, so for a lot of, maybe maybe two years, you know, uh, it was a confusion about the legitimacy of my writing capabilities and I started off as a poet, and I was very good at poetry, yet philosophy is a big step up from poetry, because you can write ten poems a day, people will enjoy them. Philosophy is a serious subject, um, so I needed to develop my skills, 